Welcome to the service of worship with the First Baptist Church of Henderson for the fifth Sunday in Eastertide. We are still the church while scattered, so thank you for joining us in your own space and way and time. In these ways, we can be united for the sole purpose of worshiping our living God. An order of service may be found on our website, fbchenderson.net. It includes the songs and scriptures we will use during this time, so I encourage you to download the PDF. Click on the Worship tab, select Worship Bulletins from the bottom of the drop-down menu, then May 10th should appear as the first option. While on our site, you may look for a list of opportunities we have for Christian formation, service, and fellowship, or check our Facebook page or your email where you may also see this list. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship God, our refuge, our fortress, and our deliverer. Please join me for our invocation. Our Father, we invoke your presence today in this hour of worship. We pray that you would calm our anxiety during this uncertain time. We ask that your peace, which transcends all understanding, calm our hearts and minds. May this service increase our awareness of and focus on the many blessings bestowed through our faith in you and your words. Amen. now our call to worship. When we feel downhearted, Jesus says, rise. When we wonder if we can continue on our journey, Jesus says, I am with you. You have nothing to fear. When we hunger and thirst in our souls for relief, 
Jesus says, come, follow me. Lord of hope and possibilities, be with us today. Give us courage and strength that we may shape our lives after you. May we open our hearts and spirits to feed upon God's healing word. Amen. Psalter lesson today comes from the 31st Psalm, verses 1 through 5 and verses 23 and 24. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And now verses 23 and 4. Love the Lord, all you, his saints. 
The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Let us rest in God's mercy as we pray. Loving God, we confess that at times we do not know the way. We have become lost in fear, scattered in hopelessness. We have forgotten how to listen for your voice. We demand signs that this will end, answers to how to move forward, because uncertainty is too heavy a burden. And yet, you have shown us the way, the truth, and the life through your Son, Jesus. You have shown us the way of love. You have shown us that our acts of love are powerful, able to overcome fear and hopelessness. Remind us of who you have called us to be and what you have called us to do. Love one another. In the name of Christ, who has shown us the way, we pray all things. Amen. We know that the way, the truth, and the life is love, and that love has been made known to us in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven, loved, and restored. In Christ, we find rest, we find hope, and we are not alone. We belong to Christ and to one another live into Christ's ways of love and peace, and God will see you through. Amen. Today's New Testament lesson is from John chapter 14, 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the words themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our final scripture lessons for this time of worship are found in the first epistle of Peter in your New Testament, and we encourage you to find your Bible and turn and follow along as we read a passage from chapter 1, verses 17 through 21, as well as from chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. We're continuing a series of lessons from this epistle of Peter to a people that are in exile in Asia Minor, who are trying to find their footing and their reason for being, trying to live into the new identity that God has offered them through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We find in that new identity that we're called to a new holy way of living, to be set apart for God's purposes in the world, not for our own. And today we find that we receive a new courage for living when living becomes difficult. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. And in chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, a passage that is thematically linked says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings so that you also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. Yet, if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a, a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear his name. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Unlike the people who initially heard this message from 1 Peter, it is relatively easy to live as a Christian in our time and in our part of the world. In fact, I don't really believe it takes much courage at all to be a Christian today if you're living in the United States of America and especially if you're privileged to live down where we call God's country in the South, what used to be known as the Bible Belt. It really doesn't take much courage. Unless you're mighty thin-skinned, unless you're easily provoked by the fact that someone might disagree with what you believe, or call into question what you might believe, or someone who might think you're a little bit off of your rocker for spending the time you spend worshiping and serving God, especially in the face of a culture that is dominated by secularism. The most that's likely to happen in a negative way to a Christian in America, in our time, is to suffer some hurt feelings. And as we are fond of saying in the South, if that happens to you, bless your little heart. But it wasn't so with those who first heard this message from 1 Peter. They were under great threat. 
they were experiencing some kind of persecution. We cannot be certain exactly what it was, but we can make some educated guesses. It may be that these people were living toward the end of 60 AD or 70 AD, just shortly after Emperor Nero had blamed the burning of Rome on the Christian people and had introduced them to the first but not the harshest of persecutions that was to come. Or if this letter is dated a little later, as some believe it probably is, long about the end of the first century, then there was a much more dangerous person ruling Rome and the Roman world by the name of Domitian, a crazy man who was requiring everybody in the empire to bow down and worship him as Lord, including Christians who simply would not do that even at the cost of their own life. In spite of this, they are counseled here to, quote, live out their time as foreigners in reverent fear and to trust in God who raised Jesus from the dead and glorified him. And in verse 22 of the first portion that we read, they are told that their faith and their hope is to be in God and in God alone. And therefore, it is concluded in chapter 4, verse 19, let those suffering in accordance with God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. Furthermore, the author really surprises them. I'm certain he surprised them, for his words surprised me when he said, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, if you are suffering for the, for the cause of Christ or called into question or persecuted because of your faith in Christ, you are, hold on, blessed. Well, that doesn't make sense. Since when does enduring persecution or suffering or even marginalization feel like being blessed? But as Christian people, we know that one of the tenets of gospel truth is that the first are last and the last are first, and that those who suffer for the, for the Christ and for his sake are blessed. And so with these words, the author begins to instill a new courage into these early Christians who are struggling in a world uh, that will not accept them, that in most cases is rejecting them, at least rejecting them, possibly physically tormenting them. And they and we are exhorted to lean into suffering like that with joy, believing that this brings glory to God through Jesus Christ. The question that I've grappled with all week long in preparation for this sermon is how we, as Christians protected as we are by law and by cultural precedent, who really exist in what I would describe as a large bubble of protection, and security, how are we to understand and apply a message that was written for people who practice their faith with no security whatsoever? To do that, we have to understand their context. We have to make some attempt to build a bridge across that context to our context, which means understanding our own context and there hopefully be bold and courageous enough to find some point of application. Christian suffering and persecution was the immediate context of the people who first received this letter. And they are dressed as exiles or foreigners or pilgrims. They are people who are living in a land where they have no advantage, where they have no support system, they don't most likely have families of origin to lean on. They certainly didn't have large congregations of which they were part. They were small family units that gathered and neighbors that gathered from house to house. 
they were misunderstood, and sometimes their words and their actions were taken out of context so that they were accused of all manner of things that they weren't actually guilty of. And in chapter 4, verse 12, they are evidently feeling the heat for that, if you'll pardon the pun. And the writer says, don't be surprised at this fiery ordeal. Maybe, maybe just there an allusion to Nero setting fire to Rome. The larger context of Christian history is filled with stories of Christian people suffering for no other fact than the fact that they are Christian. Now, we all suffer. Many people are suffering right now. It has nothing to do with their faith, and often suffering befalls us. It has absolutely nothing to do with our belief in God or the way we practice our belief in God. It's just part of the human condition. But in this case, and in the case of much of human history, Christians have suffered simply because they were Christians. In or around 109 or 10 uh, AD in the Common Era, as some might say, there was a letter written by the governor of Bithynia to the Roman emperor. His name was Pliny. And Pliny had had a situation brought to him. Some people in his province were accused of being Christians. And because they were accused of being Christians, it was assumed that they believed all kinds of strange things, that they were unruly and untrustworthy, disrespectful, and that they were anti-authority and that they posed a threat to the empire. And in trying to sort some of that out, Pliny had to question some of those Christians about their beliefs, and when he wasn't sure to do what to do with them, he wrote a letter to the emperor Trajan saying, this is what I've done, and I need to know whether you approve or not. And Trajan writes back and tells him he's done a good job. Well, here's part of one of those letters that he writes to Trajan when he says, I interrogated these people who were accused of being Christian. I interrogated them as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. And those who persisted, I ordered to be executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness, and inflexible obstinacy surely deserved to be punished. They asserted, however, that the sub sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God, and to bind themselves by oath, not to some crime, but not to commit fraud or theft or adultery or falsify their trust. No, they simply gathered to sing their hymn, he is saying, to pray their prayers, and he went on to say that afterwards it was their custom to assemble again later in the day and share a meal, just a common meal, he said, of ordinary and innocent food. But even this, Pliny says, they ceased doing upon my edict. In other words, these Christians were not found to be doing anything wrong unless you could consider gathering before dawn on Sunday morning to sing a hymn of praise to Christ and sharing their community together, their vows of loyalty to Christ and to one another together, or sharing a meal together later in the afternoon, unless you could consider these things to be a crime, they were guilty of nothing. And yet Pliny continues, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was 
by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. So we know that within at least 30 to 40 years, maybe 5 to 10 years, of the time that this letter of 1 Peter is written, that the outright persecution of Christians simply because they are Christian is beginning to take place. And it gets worse. For at least the next 200 years, many of them are put to death by martyrdom. And even as late as the 1900s, 1917 in Russia, very little has changed when the Bolsheviks destroy tens of thousands of Russian Orthodox churches and publicly execute leading members of the clergy and as many as 500,000 Orthodox Christians are put to death because they are Christians. Even today, some estimates say that Christians primarily in Eastern countries are denied basic human rights and some imprisoned or executed upwards of 100,000 a year. And that's not just a story that applies to Christians. We know that other religious minorities suffer a similar fate. I do not share these examples in order to suggest that persecution is unique to Christian people, but to illustrate that the threat that is spoken of in 1 Peter was a very real threat. But there's a call to courage and proper response, and that call is equally as real as the danger. In chapter 4, had we read the entire chapter, we would have read these words from verse 1, since Christ has suffered in the flesh. Our primary example for understanding how to deal with suffering when it does come our way, suffering that happens simply because of our religious belief, we begin by looking at the example of Jesus, who did not defend himself, who did not lash out in anger or retribution, but who calmly, humbly, lovingly offered himself up, even to an open shame. And in verse 13 of that passage that we read, we're told to rejoice in the fact that we may have an opportunity to share in the sufferings of Jesus. And further, to know that it is because of his name that we suffer, and therefore the Spirit of God is resting on us if that happens. Now there's a word of warning in that text, and it basically is this, let's make sure if we're going to suffer, we're suffering for Jesus and for Jesus' sake and not for something else. Christians were exhorted to be exemplary citizens, the most honorable, the most respectful, filled with the greatest integrity, the, the, the most law-abiding. They were instructed over and over again by the church fathers in reflection upon scripture and their experience to be model citizens. And so the writer says, make sure that you're not suffering for doing something stupid, like murdering someone or stealing from someone or even meddling in somebody else's business when it's none of your business. But if you do suffer because you carry this name Christian, and that word is actually used here in this text, it's very rare to see that word in Scripture, and this is one of the first times in the writing of the New Testament that it appears. If you suffer because you choose to carry that title, 
More importantly, if you suffer because you properly behave as one who has been awarded that title by the Spirit of God, do not be ashamed. Do not be put to shame by that. It's interesting to me that he doesn't say don't be offended. Don't have your feelings hurt. Being shamed is much deeper than being insulted. We get all up in a tizzy because somebody insults us. But what if, like these people, we were being physically threatened for our faith. So again, I come back to my dilemma. How, how do we understand this? As, as Christians living kind of in a bubble-wrapped world with all of the, the laws that protect us, all the freedoms we enjoy, all the privilege that's been built up for us for centuries, how do we understand this? And I tell you, I've struggled. I can't find a good comparison, really. I do think that maybe what helps is reflecting on some things that we ought to be ashamed of. We ought maybe, for instance, to be ashamed of the fact that we are normally more interested in maintaining our status and our power than we are in helping and serving others who have no power. I think we should be ashamed that as a people with ancestors who experienced persecution and as a people with spiritual siblings around the world who are still experiencing persecution, we should be ashamed at turning a blind eye to that persecution. We should be ashamed, in my opinion, having benefited from vast protection of freedom of religion to not advocate more for that same freedom for others and particularly with those who disagree with us. We might, should be ashamed for allowing laws to stand that discriminate against other people for any reason or no reason as if they are less than fully human and less than fully loved creations of God Almighty and children of the sovereign King Jesus who died for them. And perhaps we should be ashamed that unlike the audience that first heard this letter who possessed nothing, that we possess so much and hoard so much of it, unwilling to help those in our world who have very little, if anything. For I have to ask myself, how does such behavior share in the suffering of Christ? And how does such behavior bring any glory to God? And how can we believe and hope and pray that the spirit of God's glory rest on us when we who have people who were once persecuted become the persecutors. That passage ends with these words. It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. If it begins with us, what will be the end for those who do not obey the gospel of God? It's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. We do not have the privilege of reading a story like this 
in thinking about our Christian ancestors who suffered and merely feeling sorry for them. We can't leave the story there. It's not enough for us to recognize that Christian brothers and sisters around the world still suffered simply because they're Christian and to say a polite little prayer on their behalf. It's not enough for us to live in the comfort and security of our place and our time without doing everything within our power to extend that comfort and that security to all Christians in all places, but honestly to all people in all places. One look at the news headlines is proof that we have a lot of work to do. Are we willing to order our lives after Christ in such a way as to put our own security at risk? Are we willing to let go of and give up enough of what we possess in order that others may possess something? Where is our courage lacking or untested? And what keeps us from claiming the courage that's offered to us through this passage and those like it that assure us that if we do the right thing, the power of God will overshadow us, take care of us, secure us, and God will be glorified and in our suffering for Christ, we will actually be blessed, perhaps because we will have chosen to be a blessing. Amen.
Let us pray together. God of presence and fullness, we are grateful that you meet us wherever we are right now, in a sanctuary, a living room, or perhaps outside in the sanctuary of your creation. You are with us. And Lord, we seek your peace in these anxious times. And we are grateful for the ways you have shown up and the love shared among neighbors and between strangers on a daily basis. Today we celebrate our mothers and each person that has been as a mother to us. Through our mothers, we understand the fullness of your love for us, the fullness of the image in which we are created. You are not only father to us, but also mother, gathering her young under the protection of her wing. We give thanks for all those who have loved us, nurtured us, and given us life. We thank you for the blessing that is the relationship of a mother and her child, for the love shared abundantly, the heart given freely to another, and the abiding patience needed to sustain a mother day after day. We ask you to fill their hearts, minds, bodies, and souls with your good grace. When the moments and days may be difficult, help us to see that you are the provider of all nourishment. Comforting Spirit, we also ask for your peace and comfort for those among us who experience pain in this celebration the pain of loss for those who have lost their mother, the pain of loss for those who have lost their children, the pain of dreams unfulfilled, the pain of love unrealized. God, be present with us in this pain. Show us the way to the well of your friendship that sustains us through this all. Lord, we lift up to you the motherless child and the childless mother. And for them, we seek your deep and abiding mercy. God of healing, we ask for resilience, for strength, for wisdom, for our local health care workers. As they face difficult circumstances each day, remind them of your love for them and of our love for them. And our gratitude for their willingness to care for each of us in our time of need. Lord, so many of the vulnerable in our community are at significant risk right now, and we feel helpless to make things right. But your love and your light compel us to remember that we are in this life together, whether through a pandemic or in times of relative calm. So we come with this simple plea, we need you. We need you because life is hard right now. We do not have a road map. We are consumed by this virus, yet life continues on. Our loved ones get sick, babies are born, jobs are lost, and new opportunities emerge. And Lord, the scourge of racism has shown once again itself for the evil humanity denying life stealing sin that it is but lord just because we have been reminded of this evil on the news does not mean that it is not experienced every single day remove the scales from our eyes that would blind us to this reality and it is through all of this that we need you we need your hope and we need to be your hope in this world. Just as Jesus showed us as he walked through the gifts and difficulties of life on this earth. So now we pray the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you have no doubt noticed, each week we intentionally take time to give thanks for the many gifts present within this community. And today I celebrate and give thanks for the many ways this congregation works together to form Christ's followers through our Christian formation ministry, a ministry that is not merely a program to be planned. Christian formation does not and cannot stand alone. It infuses every part of our life together. In each bell group, choir, Sunday school class, youth group, mission circle, and beyond, 
We are formed in the way of Christ. We learn how to love God and love each other better. But today, in particular, I want to give thanks for something pretty unique to our congregation. When I arrived in Henderson almost seven years ago, I was intrigued by the fact that every other year, a group from FBC takes an entire weekend to get away and fellowship together, learn together, play together, and give our relationships the gift of time together. Our church-wide retreat is a sacred time that has roots that nourish us far beyond one weekend. And after each retreat, I am reminded that Christian formation at First Baptist is more than just another class because this congregation appreciates that we do not grow closer to God or even to each other merely by learning facts about God or about each other. We grow close to God and to each other by being in relationship. Christian formation at its heart is a relationship and it is relational. And it is these relationships that sustain us in times and seasons like we are in now. It is these relationships that allow a group to quickly form for sacred reading on Wednesday mornings. In a sacred hour, we read scripture together and find ways to love and support each other, even through our virtual connection. It is these relationships that allow a project to develop and flourish to provide isolation gowns for our local healthcare workers. It is these relationships that allow kids together via Zoom each week to play together and to learn together. Blessings surely flow from our relationships, from our humble attempts to follow God as a community. And we praise God for every moment invested in these ministries and in each other. I leave us with this benediction from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 